brief introduction. Uh, as you know, most of our work uh, beyond the true scientific interest that is understanding nature, uh, but most of our work is uh, driven, and if not driven, at least funded, by the hope that uh, what we learn about biology system, biological systems could be useful to understand what happened in diseases and could eventually help us developing tools that allow us to interfere with biological systems, hopefully in a good way. Um, and among these tools, small molecules have been highly dominating the, the market uh, in recent years. And uh, although there's quite nice, um, so this doesn't work, but uh, maybe I should turn it on. Okay. Uh, despite quite nice increase, for instance, in monoclonal antibodies, still uh, small molecules have been um, the, the main players. And uh, they are very important in many fields, especially in the field of cancer, where, for instance, the kinase, uh, the kinome has been uh, heavily studied in terms of finding small molecules. That's okay, that's okay. Um, small molecules that, that target this, these proteins. And the way it works is often uh, people identify a primary target that they're interested. They think, well, if we inhibit this, it may be useful. And they develop uh, different small molecules that bind to these targets. And this is the typical information that we have in databases. Now, despite all the work uh, this is a medical chemistry work. There's still a substantial fraction of molecules for which we know that they have some bioactivity, but we have no idea about the targets. So these numbers come from the Campbell database, and, and many of these molecules uh, have been tested, for instance, in phenotypic assays, where you test not for target, but you just screen over screen a population of cell. It could be in yeast, it could be in cell lines, uh, or whatever, and you find that there is some effect. Uh, Another important feature of small molecules is that typically they do not bind only one target. And even for, for FDA-approved drugs, it's estimated that on average there's actually at least six different targets that are bound by these molecules. And uh, of course, these, these uh, secondary targets are also very important. Uh, they may explain side effects, they may explain some toxicity, uh, and they're also very interesting because they could allow potentially, if you have a molecule that is known and maybe doesn't have too much toxicity, you could reuse it for another purpose because it also binds another protein that's involved in another pathway. Uh, but overall, it's not so easy to detect all targets for, mole for small molecules experimentally because you need to screen many different proteins. And therefore, there's a, a need for, for uh, computational approach that help you predicting the, the targets of these molecules. And uh, there's been different approaches that have been developed historically. Many people spend time uh, using protein structure in order to, to see whether a small molecule could fit in the binding pocket using docking or pocket comparison or, or these kind of algorithms. And uh, well, this is very powerful in, in some cases because then you get an atomistic description of the interaction. And you can think, well, maybe I'd be able to improve, to optimized by ligands, by knowing how it could optimally fill this, this target. So it's, it's a very powerful approach. Um, it has also some limitations, sorry, um, that some are listed here is that, of course, you, you need to have some crystal structure, which is not always the case. Uh, sometimes the, the calculations can be not so easy if you think about all the complexity that can take in place in a structure, all the, the flexibility that is, that is present in those structures. It's, it's not uh, a solved problem, at least. Uh, and it's fairly long to, to compute, uh, to do these computations. So another approach that we were very much interested in, I should mention that I'm not the first one to work on this, uh, is to, to use a ligand-based approach, which relies on the principle that similar molecules will likely have similar targets, especially if they have some bioactivity. So we know they, they do something in an organism, and we f if we find another molecule that's very similar to this one, it's likely that it has the same target. So basically, if you are given a molecule, you will compare it to a bunch of other molecules for which you know the targets, you find one that is fairly similar, and by similarity, you map the targets. Uh, so this approach has become, has become quite popular recently, and one reason is that there's been a very strong increase in the number of ligand protein pairs that are uh, annotated in databases. So typically over the years, this is the increase in the Campbell database of, of the number of, of small molecules in this database. So it's a linear scale. It's, we're not in the world of sequencing, for those of you who are used to this big increase. Uh, but it's, it is still, it is still uh, 
quite surprising to see that this, this curve is, is really going up and there's no sign of, 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 of slowing down, uh, which means that we have access to more and more data about ligand and, uh, binding to, to proteins. And that's, I mean, definitely you should use this kind of information when you work. Um, Another important aspect of the, the, the method I've shown you is how you define similarity between small molecules. Uh, and, a, and a first approach is, is to use the chemical similarity. People use it, sometimes call it the 2D or the fingerprint base. So it's based on the idea that you should, but for comparing two molecules, you can actually find fragments, different fragments in these molecules. And if you find them in both, uh, it will be a sign that the molecules are similar. So basically it would work like this, you identify linear fragments and you build a, a fingerprint vector and you do the same thing for another molecule and then you compare the fingerprint vector with the, the molecular similarity that's uh, widely used to the tiny moto coefficient which is nothing else than the JACAR index. Uh, this, this has been already used for, for target prediction in, in methods like C, target hunter, hit peak or, or other methods. Um, Another idea that we, we were interested in is to compare the shape of molecule. And this, this really relies on the idea that if two molecules bind the same protein, it's likely that they can fit in the same pocket, and therefore having a similar shape is also an, inter uh, an interesting information. So basically what you do is you take the molecules, you overlay them and you look if, if they are similar. And you can add information also about the electrostatic distribution, the hydrophobicity <coughs> as, as additional feature that we did. Uh, if you're interested, I can, I can talk more about this, but I don't want to enter into these details here. Uh, so just a few examples. Here is, for instance, a ligand of CDK1, where there was one known ligand that is fairly similar in terms of shape and electrostatic distribution, you can see with these uh, oxygen atoms, but there was no real similarity in terms of fingerprints. Uh, the reverse example, uh, where actually the fingerprint similarity is much better, is ligands, for instance, of these proteins, where there is clear similarity between them. While if you, if you use a shape similarity, you couldn't fit so well the, 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 these, these query molecules into the known ligands. And it's, in this case, it suggests that the fingerprint works better. So of course, this suggests maybe we could actually combine both of them and you can do it very easily by, by computing this different similarity, predicting the targets based on each similarity and then combining them. So the first question we ask is, well, how do this different approach work? Is it better to use the fingerprint? Is it better to use the shape? Is it better to combine both of them? And for this, we, we did a cross-validation using the Campbell data set. So we, we selected positives as, as tar, uh, ligands that have less than 10 micromolar, which gives rise to quite a bunch of molecules, uh, 260, uh, 90, 696 targets and quite a few interactions. And then for the negative data, we took everything that was available in Campbell, but we had to complement it with lots of random data. And we'll come back to this. So if you do the, 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 the cross validation and you plot this AUC, what you observe is that first the shape that is black uh, performs less well than the, the fingerprints. And then the combining basically gives you a very, very slight increase here, but not much of a difference, suggesting that actually most of the information is already encoded in the fingerprints. However, if you look at the scale, you will notice that these are extremely high values. So I forgot to mention that I'm plotting the AUC value for different sizes of ligands. So this is not a, a rock curve. So this is just average AUC value for ligands of this size, this size, this size, and so on. Um, but I mentioned you get extremely high values, which Always a bit suspicious when you get these very high values. And I think that's, that's an important point also to remember that uh, AUC values are highly dependent on the kind of benchmark that you use. And the very high values can be obtained in some cases, especially if you have a very, very large, of negative, large space of negative data. Uh, so typically, if you imagine that your space of positive is here and the negative space is all around, so you have some uh, sampling of the positive states that are true positive, say, and then you have some sampling of the negative space. Now, in this case, you can actually fit many models that fairly well explain your data 
in terms of separating the positives from the negatives, but still are not fully accurate because clearly they don't encapsulate these kind of regions here and there. Uh, but this is just because it's very difficult to have negative data, they are very close to the positive data. So this is a common um, issue in, in many actually machine learning uh, problems that we have in conventional biology, but it's important to remember uh, that by themselves, AUC values are not so meaningful. They only, they fully depend on the kind of benchmarking data set that you have. They're useful for comparing between different methods, but not for, for assessing whether a method is good or not uh, in absolute. Uh, now, this is the second reason why we get so good AUC values that is more uh, specific to the kind of data we're dealing with. Um, and this is actually because of the high uh, degeneracy that this data set have. So this is the ligands, a set of ligands of this protein, and you can see that many of them are highly similar. And this is because often medicinal chemists, once they have a lead compound, they will check many replacement at different side chains by changing, for instance, uh, adding some atoms here and there, uh, which are not big changes, and therefore the data are highly redundant. So we thought we should also eliminate these kind of things uh, in the cross-validation, and one way is to group ligands by scaffold, and then when testing this protein, for instance, not, not allowing comparison with the same scaffolds, uh, we went even one step further by using information about the history when these molecules were developed uh, and preventing comparison between molecules that have been tested in the same assay because likely there was biases by the way the assay was designed. Um, so if you do this, what you observe is this kind of, of, uh, of results for AUC values. And in this case, you see that um, overall, the, the fingerprint is still performing better than the shape similarity, especially for larger molecules. But for smaller ones, there is a clear interest into combining these two similarity values. Um, so we get more realistic estimation of the performance, and, and it clearly shows that this region, the, the combination of two types of completely orthogonal information, or at least partly orthogonal information, uh, are, is quite useful. What is important to realize is that also this region corresponds exactly to the kind of uh, size that molecules have, uh, especially FDA-approved FDA molecules have. So in this region, it, it's quite interesting to combine both of them. And it's, it's an inter interesting aspect that actually uh, using shape similarity, which was not so obvious from previous studies, is, is quite useful in this case. So then we ask a second question. So far, I've been showing you uh, cross-validation only based on um, small molecules that bind human target. However, we have targets in many other species because people test more interesting molecules in mice or in rats. People do chemical screening in yeast. People do chemical screening in, in, in worm. And this is increasingly uh, becoming popular. There were some talks yesterday about this also, even using different kind of similarity, like genetic interaction similarity. There was a nice talk by Chad Myers yesterday. Um, so we thought, <coughs> let's ask a very basic question. Uh, how can we actually map this interaction across different organisms so that we can learn something from mouse that could guide uh, prediction in human. So in other words, if you have a small molecule, you want to test it in human, you don't, maybe you don't have similar molecules, but there's one molecule that is fairly similar that is known to bind a mouse target. Can we map them, the, the target in human? Uh, so we did this for these four organisms. We couldn't go much beyond vertebrates because unfortunately in the Campbell database and as well as other databases, there's much, much less data. So these are, these are still the organisms that are most widely used and could be used for cross-validation. Uh, for our homology relationship, we use the ensemble tree, farm, and author DB. Uh, and for validation, as, as time had passed, uh, we were lucky because there was new version of the Campbell database. So basi we basically used all molecules in this new version that were not in the version that was used to build our method. Uh, so this left us with a bunch of interactions. Uh, and before going to the validation, it's also important to point that by using homology, especially orthology, you increase a lot the space of the possible targets, which is quite interesting in a sense because uh, it allows you to make predictions for molecules, for targets that have never been assayed in, in any experimental uh, setup. So if you do the, the validation, we compare here the, the, the prediction using no homology information and using only orthology, so only cross-species information. What we observe is that, well, in human, it wasn't much of a chance change, but in rat, mouse, and cow, there was a nice improvement in the predictions. 
We also ask the question, well, what if you, we use paralogy? So then mapping uh, within the same organism among paralogs. And here we actually see, this is in orange, uh, that the, the including paralogy information is actually not good, does not improve, and even worsen sometimes the predictions. Um, we also tested a special case, which is if not a similar molecule is fine in other organisms, but actually exactly the same molecule. So basically it's this case like this where you have a molecule, you want to ask whether it binds something in human, and you find that this exact molecule, so not a similar molecule, has been tested in mouse, and then you want to map back the predictions. So if you look in this case, which is um, the ideal case for orthology-based uh, prediction interaction mapping, uh, in all four organisms there was a clear improvement in accuracy uh, by using the, the orthology-based method, which, which is quite nice because it wasn't observed often, although people have used this in single studies, there was no real statistics about this. So overall what we found is that orthology improves the prediction, but including paralogy relationship does not. And while you can speculate about which are the different reasons, uh, two reasons that I could come up for is one that in general we, based on evolutionary studies, we observe that there is less conservation of function among paralogs compared to orthologs. Yeah. Uh, so this could explain also why we see less conservation of small molecule ligand interactions. Uh, and uh, one, one other possibility would be that actually sometimes people design a molecule to target specifically one member of a paralog family and therefore by mapping it to all four or three other members of the paralogs uh, you get false positives that, that, uh, that are not correct. Um, so these are the two, two things but I don't have data to support these claims actually so I should do some more work about this. Um, so if you're interested in this prediction, I'm still advertising our website where you can test them and you can do this prediction in different organisms. Uh, so basically we, we found that shape, uh, well if, if you have to make prediction, in some cases it's useful to combine the, the 2D and the shape similarity. Uh, we found also important biases in this data set and we came up with some attempt to help addressing these biases and, and removing their effects. And we also observed that orthology based predictions are useful but paralogy does not add much. Um, of course, a future perspective that would be really interesting would be to combine this with a more structural view of docking these ligands to see whether it helps or not, maybe not. <coughs> so before concluding, I just want to say a small advertisement. Um, small molecules have been very interesting uh, in, in the field of cancer, which is of a high interest for my lab, uh, as a way of targeting directly cancer cells. But over the years, it's been realized that actually other approaches are equally powerful that target cells that, like normal cells, especially immune cells, that uh, surround the tumors and play an important roles. So this is also a very strong interest in my lab. Uh, could be uh, antigen prediction, neoantigen prediction, could be understanding the relationship between immune infiltration and tumor evolution or tumor response to therapy. So if you're interested, there is actually an uh, open postdoc position in the lab in Lausanne, and I should say that Lausanne is really becoming a center for, for immunotherapy and cancer research, so it's a really good place to, to do this kind of research. Uh, so this is just a bit of an advertisement note. Um, now, let me acknowledge the different people in my lab. Uh, the collaborators with whom we did most of the work on, on this target prediction, especially Vincent Zouet and Olivier Michelin. The, the vital IT for the computing, I, I'm happy I put this, I didn't know Yannis was the chair of this, but uh, <laughs> this is the high performance cluster in Lausanne that is actually uh, uh, managed by the group of Yannis. So, and a funding agency and all of you for your attention. Thanks, David. You can, you're going to be able to continue to compute. Yeah. <laughs> Questions from the audience? You said that you don't like the accuracy is around 90 So this is the AUC value. This yeah. is the area of your accuracy spectrum. Have you done an independent validation with non-trained non uh, data? Like um, so, for instance, what we did is say in the second part of the homology uh, interaction, this is really new data that came later in the in uh, this. Uh, we didn't put you know, a given threshold because if you want to compute accuracy, like percentage of accuracy, we didn't put the threshold. But we have this plot that I can show you. 
So this is another way of doing the validation where we compute among the, for each molecule, among the top 15 predictions, whether one target is correct, which is more realistic to what you can test experimentally. Say you, you have the mean to test 15 different targets on, on your small molecules, you want at least hope to get one. And uh, this is a fraction of small molecules for which at least one of the top 15 predicted targets was correct. Uh, so we are around, uh, this is general for any, any molecules, uh, and we are around like 60-70% in this data. And, and again you see that by um, taking into account homology, for instance in this case there was a clear improvement uh, of the predictions.